Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So okay. now we can start, I think. Okay. It is a pleasure to present you Giovanni Rosso from Concordia University. And he's going to speak about piadica, eh, funzione le piadica El para piad. que specifics. Well, muchas gracias para la, para la invitación. And the talk will be in English because my Spanish is not good enough. If you have any questions, you can write in the chat or just talk. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we are going to talk about uh, periodical functions, what they are, how do they arise. And so I start with an example that uh, a lot of people have seen, but it's always good uh, to start with this. The Riemann zeta function is the function that you define using this infinite expression. It's an infinite sum of one no over n to the s. It converges absolutely when the real part of s is greater than one. And so you can rearrange it to get this expression as a product. And it's known that, uh, for example, zeta of two was calculated by Euler is pi square over six. Zeta of four is pi fourth over 90 and so on. And indeed, uh, if we know very well the value of the Riemann zeta function at positive even integers. Indeed, the zeta of k, when k is even, is uh, up to some minus one, the k to Bernoulli number, uh, multiplied by two pi to the k. Here, if you see minus one is i squared, so this can go there, Time divided by two k factorial. So you see that mysteriously, all the even, in the even integers, the Riemann zeta function is practically a rational number times two pi. And uh, the k are the Bernoulli number that I recall they are defined, we take the Taylor expansion of this function. The Bernoulli number are zero when k is odd, and they are some rational numbers when k is even. And uh, well, these are not the only property of the Riemann zeta function that we care today. So we consider the completed Riemann zeta function. This is uh, somehow the Riemann zeta function where we had the Euler factor at infinity, the real gamma function which is uh, gamma of uh, s over two times pi to the minus s over two. And it's well known that uh, this function is holomorphic almost everywhere. And it satisfies a very nice functional equation that relates uh, s to one minus s. And well, why did I bring up uh, this functional equation? Because now we can use the functional equation to calculate, here we put 2k, here we put one minus 2k, and we get that for all negative k, we get z of, well, for all positive k, z of minus k is the Bernoulli number at k plus one divided by k plus one. So we get the, the, the values as uh, at the negative integers are very simple number. They are zero any times uh, k is even because the, if k is even, k plus one is odd. And uh, well, it's kind of surprising. And what we do when we do periodic function is study how this number vary when we vary k, how varies their congruence modulo p? So for example, if we take some case in a progression modulo p, are these numbers also in a progression modulo p? And we will say this is the case most of the time. So let's move to Kummer congruences. Kummer congruences are a series of periodic properties satisfied by Bernoulli number. The first one is that if p minus one does not divide k, then this value z of minus k is a periodic integer. Its periodic norm is less than one, which means that it's a periodic integer. If I take two numbers that are very congruent modulo p to the n times p minus one, then the Bernoulli number modified, if possible, by this one minus p to the k minus one, is congruent to the Bernoulli number for k prime, always adding this modifying factor. If k and k prime are big enough, these numbers are one modulo p to the n, but still we have to leave it because we will see later why we need this. And the third property is what happens when p minus one divides k, which is the case that was not considered in the first two points. Well, then the Bernoulli number is a simple, the denominator is just p. So once we multiply by p the Bernoulli number, we get questions or, uh, when we multiply by p the Bernoulli number, we get minus one. And so, well, they are not integer, integral, but they are almost. So what do we do to create a periodic function? We choose a class i, modulo p minus one, which is non-zero. And we consider only the integers k, which are congruent to i, modulo p minus one. As Chinese reminder theorem, 
the p and p minus one are co-prime. So these integers are dense in ZP. And so there exists a unique uh, continuous function that I call zeta pi of s from zp to zp that on the integer k congruent to y modulo p minus one takes exactly these values, which is the values of Riemann zeta function, where from which we remove the Euler factor at p. And uh, so yeah, by the second point, this is a continuous function because if these two numbers are very close modulo p to the n, so they are very close in zp, then their values are also very close in zp. So this is a good continuous function. And even better, this is analytic in the sense that there is an infinite series, a formal power series, LPI of t, such that I can get this continuous function just substituting the variable t with uh, the expression 1 plus p to the s minus 1. And uh, well, I told you the values of zeta pi only at integer k congruent to i modulo p minus 1 would appear at the other integer. At the other integer, I get not really Riemann zeta function, but I get the values of the Dirichlet function associated to the Tech-Muller character. This is the character of order p minus one. And uh, yeah, so this function, we know the values of this function of all integer k. And we can also define a, a Riemann zeta function for the values congruent to zero modulo p minus one. It's not continuous. It defines a meromorphic function of s. And it comes from a power, formal power series in which I have to allow a denominator, one over t, because I have a pole at t equals zero, which corresponds to s equal to zero. I have again a pole, exactly, kind of like the classical Riemann zeta function. And the surprising feature is that these properties are not only properties of Riemann zeta function, but plenty of L functions are expected to satisfy this property. So, Let's start with another example. We start with a normalized eigenform of weight R, level gamma one of N. So it's an eigenform for all the echo operators. It has a, for the diamond operator, it has a nice Fourier expansion. Its L function is this one. It's just the mailing transform of F. And this so is similar to Riemann's function. It's an infinite series, A N of F over N to the S. And the theorem, due mainly to Manning and Shimura, is that there are two complex numbers which are non-zero, such that when we take the values at the integer going from one to the weight minus one, if we divide by a suitable power of two pi i and by this complex number, then we get an algebraic number for the, the values of the function are algebraic numbers. And the choice of the period plus or minus will depend on the choice of the integer j. Okay, and this is already good because if we want to find the Piadical function, the piadic avatar of this, at least we need to make sense of this complex, of the values of this function, which are complex number. We would like to make sense of them as piadic number. They are algebraic number. It's well known that the Fourier coefficients are algebraic integers if we take a normalized eigenform. And so once they are algebraic, we can see as piadic number. And indeed, we have a piadical function also in this case, in, not always. So for this talk, we will suppose that f is p ordinary, meaning that the p Fourier coefficient is a piadic unit. And in this case, we have again a piadical function. We get the power series, more precisely p minus one power series, LP of f sigma. If sigma here is a variable in zp star. And the form of this uh, ring of zp star is, uh, well, is p minus one copy of, z of uh, t. So somehow we have p minus one formal series, such that any times we evaluate this on the character that sends z in zp star to a finite order character k of z times z to the j, what do we get? Well, we get the values of f twisted by j at j divided by, we see the period, we see two pi i, we see a Gauss sum, and then some corrective factor at p. Somehow with alpha p, is uh, the unit solution to the Ake polynomial. So somehow it's the Ake eigenvalue for uh, when we see f, we can, see, uh, we can look at f as a form of level gamma one of NP. We have a UP operator and alpha is one of the possible eigenvalues that I can find on UP over this destabilization of f. And uh, we can even say something when chi is a trivial character. If chi is trivial, instead of having this goes sum, and this factor, we just get some sort of Euler factor. This is the, what, part of the Euler factor of the L function of F, 
we, we have an expression of this as an infinite product. And this is half of the factor at P, and this is somehow symmetric to the factor that we are living there. And uh, well, this is not a coincidence. There is a big set, a big uh, series of conjectures, a lot of conjecture that somehow tell us that we should expect this kind of behavior in general. So what do we do? We start with a motive. For simplicity today, a motive over Q with Q coefficient. So somehow it's like you know, for the modular form, it's like if you work with the modular form with rational for the coefficient. And so what is the motive for this talk? I don't want to go too much into algebraic geometry, so I just care about this realization. For every prime L, I have the Eladic realization ML, which is a QL representation of the Galois group of Q, which satisfies a series of property. First of all, it is a ramified as a finite set of bed prime, S, which is independent of L. And well, I, I must allow ramification at L. And if I take any prime which is different from two prime L1 and 2, I take the characteristic polynomial of the geometric Frobenius on the part Eladic L1 Galois representation fixed by the inertia. This is the same one as the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius at Q on the L2 realization of my motive. And as I want a Q coefficient, I will demand not only that they are the same, but that the, the values are integer. And uh, then I need the two more realization. One is the Betty realization, which is a Q vector space with an involution of infinity. If, if you think that M comes, for example, for geometry, this should be the Betty cohomology, and the involution is simply the complex conjugation acting on your complex variety. Then I have another realization, which is the Deram realization. It's always a vector space with a filtration. You should think of it as the Deram filtration of the homology. Such that when I go over C, I got my Hodge decomposition. So my vector space is the composing part PQ that has HPQ, such that uh, the complex conjugation swap the PQ with the QP part. And to, com to finish, I need all the possible comparison isomorphism that I can ask for. So I, when I, I want base to base chain this uh, ML uh, to CL, and I want to fix an isomorphism between C and CL, and I want to compare M tens MCL tensor of CT with M Deram tensor of C. Okay, so for us, the motive is somehow just a bunch of vector space with some extra property. Galois representations, and some sort of uh, Deram uh, structure, and the, com and the complex and the Frobenius set infinity, complex conjugation. Okay, what do we do with this? We define the local Euler factor at Q, PQ of X is the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius on the unramified part of a Eladic representation. I take any L, which is not Q, and then I can take my characteristic polynomial there. My L function then is just going to be the product over all this prime of PQ of Q to the minus S to the minus 1. And uh, technically, this should converge uh, for a real part of S big enough because of various conjectures should tell us that all this number, the eigenvalue, some of the roots of this polynomial PQ should be when number. So this can be expanded in a sort of infinite sum and we can bound the growth of the end term. And so we should get, uh, um, we should get uh, absolute convergence for real part of S large enough. And then we also define that for the Riemann zeta function, we had to add the, the real gamma function. There is also a factor at infinity that I will analyze in a few seconds. That is kind of a bunch of uh, gamma, of real and complex gamma functions. And now we make a few hypotheses. We suppose that M is irreducible and that M is pure of weight W. This means that all the roots of the polynomial PQ that I defined before. Yeah? I think Ariel want to ask some, a question. Ah, yeah, sorry, sure. I did. Can, can I ask a question, Giovanni? So is it known that if you take a motive, then the series converges in some region, or it's a conjecture? Uh, well, it depends. If you take a motive as I defined it, it's not known. Okay, well, but, but so do, do you have some extra hypothesis on the motive? I mean, asking for the Riemann hypothesis, it's a lot, right? So oh, like, yes, what are in general the, the conditions you, you also impose in the motive in your definition for to ensure that the L series converges? Mm. 
A good question. Well, if M comes, if HHI is the ethyl cohomology of a variety, for example, then you know by some property of ethyl cohomology that uh, you have this weight bound. If I take uh, the I cohomology, then uh, all my motifs are poor of weight I. Otherwise, uh, in general, I'm not sure if the... Mm, I assume that uh, we believe that every such motif should come from geometry. So probably... Okay, okay. Then it should kind of be the cohomology of some variety, and then you have weights conjecture for that cohomology. But yeah, it's not clear from this definition why. If you don't believe that this is really, this M is just the ethyl cohomology of something, it's not clear why this should converge. Okay. Or Thank why you. we should believe uh, being pure. No, no problem. Okay, so now we choose, well, we suppose M is irreducible, M is pure of weight W, which is telling us somehow that the L function converge everywhere. And then and we should also suppose that M is not the twist of the trivial motif, so that we avoid the, a shift of the Riemann zeta function. And then what do we get? We get the Dirch number are non-zero only when P plus two is equal to W. The L factor at infinity is the term completed by the Dirch numbers. So it, if W is odd, at least I just take all the P less, uh, strictly less than Q. And then I take the shifted gamma function, S minus P, and I take HPQ copies of this. HPQ is the dimension of this vector space. And if W is even, I, uh, the, I have a w, the, the, the part H W over two, W over two. Here I have uh, some complex conjugation, so I have to take the part where I, uh, my complex conjugation acts as plus, the part where uh, it acts X minus, and I have to add this real gamma factor. And this is the factor at infinity. And the conjecture is that if I multiply this factor at infinity to my L function, then I get a nice functional equation that relates my completed L function to the completed L function of the dual motif, shifted of weight K. And up to an epsilon factor, this is kind of M to the minus S times some sort of Gauss sum. So this should be holomorphic everywhere. And uh, using the functional equation, we expect these two to be holomorphic everywhere. Okay, so now we have our motive and we suppose all this conjecture that I've just written down. We suppose that uh, we can complete our function, it's homomorphic everywhere, which at what, uh, before for the Riemann zeta function, we were kind of getting information only for uh, the even positive even number or if you want the negative odd numbers. So for which S do we expect to say something about the function? And this brings us the linear conjecture. The linear conjecture says that, well, first of all, I have to define you what is say, the linear critical integers. I take J an integer, and I say that it is the linear critical for uh, M. If uh, the factor at infinity of M and of the dual motive of M evaluated J, and there should be one plus W minus J. If none of these two factor have pole, you see here I have some gamma factor. The gamma function have some poles when, uh, for example, gamma of minus one is a, is a pole, gamma of minus two is a pole. So I want to avoid all this number, all this gamma function to have pole at j and also for the dual motives. This is important because if we suppose that this is holomorphic and if this is a pole, this must be zero. This is the case for a Riemann zeta function. The negative even integers are zero for the Riemann zeta function exactly because we know by the function equation that the function is holomorphic. The real gamma function is a pole at uh, odd uh, integers. And so we, this value must vanish, which is why we get uh, not very interesting number, zero. And so the linear says that an integer is critical somehow if you are not forced to be zero by a trivial reason. And when, the linear, when j is the linear critical, the conjecture is that the values of the L function divided by a certain period is an algebraic number. And in general, here I wrote q because my motive is over q with uh, q values. But in general, if the motive is not defined over here, but over a number field, you will expect uh, this number to be an algebraic integer to satisfy certain Galois invariance properties. So if it is an algebraic number, you can consider conjugated motives and get the conjugated L values. And MJ is defined as the determinant of this map. Somehow you can take, if you want to simplify stuff, you can take W equal to J equal to zero. 
So you take the part on the bad tick homology where uh, complex conjugation, uh, the fixed part by complex conjugation on the bad part. And I should, <clears throat> ten, I should have tensor with C everywhere here. And uh, I use the comparison in uh, isomorphisms to go to the, the RAM realization. And I want to quotient out by the field plus part. The field plus part is some I can take the on my odd filtration. It's given somehow by the pieces of the odd filtration in which P is larger. The holomorphic part is larger than something. For example, if you take an elliptic curve here, you take the homology of the elliptic curve where complex conjugation access one. And here you will take the Dirac homology modulo the homolomorphic form on your elliptic curve. And also notice that somehow, if I change the parity of J, I change the space here, but somehow the space here could not change much. For example, if you take instead of an elliptic curve, a modular form for which the H number are zero and K minus one, the part here is gonna be kind of independent of J, at least when I'm the linear critical. And so somehow this omega is telling me a bit how the position of the plus and minus part of my beta realization are inside this, uh, there is the RAM part module some field plus. Okay, and uh, if, as you know, this is uh, bad tick homology is done by cycle, the rank homology is done by uh, algebraic uh, differential form. And so the right uh, way of thinking of this omega is a period, meaning just the integral over some cycle of some differential form. Exactly like the neuron period for an elliptic curve is the integral of the invariant differential for your elliptic curve over some cycle. Okay, and so now we want to see when we have critical function. So we suppose that M is the linear critical at J equal to zero. This is just for simplicity of notation because clearly I can always twist my motive by the cyclotomic character to the J and then I can always reduce myself to the case where J, the integer I'm interested in, which is critical is zero. And just to point out that if chi is an even Dirichlet character, then M tensor chi is still the linear critical because being given does not change anything at infinity. If it odd, it will change, for example, the sign of complex conjugation here. But if uh, I'm even, I don't change anything at infinity. So the question is, so when do we expect to have a periodical function interpolating the critical values of M twisted by chi at zero? And uh, somehow here I have, uh, for the Riemann zeta function, we were lucky. We had infinitely many critical values. So we could have infinitely many values, but for a modular form of an elliptic curve, we saw that the num, the integer for which we know well the values are just the one from one to the weight minus one. And we cannot determine univocally a, periodic, a continuous periodic function just giving you k integers. We need to get something more, and that's why we introduced this Dirichlet character. The fact is that if I have a formal series, and somehow I will evaluate in place of t, I will write chi of one plus p minus one. If I have infinitely many chi's, I'm gonna have infinitely many evaluation of this formal series. And Weistas preparation theorem tell us that uh, a formal series has, has a finite number of zeros. So if I have two formal series which coincide on an infinite set of prime, they must be the same. Okay, and so, well, the question is, for a modular form to have such a nice formal series, we had to require that our uh, modular form was ordinary at P, and we're gonna now give a similar condition for uh, a motive to have uh, a periodical function. So I call V, the periodic representation associated with my motive. So I take the periodic realization MP is a representation of G of Q, and I restrict it to a decomposition group FQP. So now I have the representation of the Galois group of QP with QP values. Um, it's generically conjecture that uh, for if I'm motivic, my V is a, as a state decomposition. It means that when I tensor with CP, uh, my decomposition becomes just a bunch of twist of the trivial representation by the cyclotomic character. You know that we don't have many interesting CP representation because somehow a split finite dimensional CP representation. And uh, we suppose that somehow V, when we go to CP, the Galois action somehow is on box, so it becomes 
kind of messy, it becomes just a sum of copies of CP. And I call this set K, is a multiset because I could have multiple appearance of some Ks. It's the set of watch state weights of, of V. And these are exactly the number appearing in the object decomposition. If you want all the possible piece that appear here, give me the edge state weight. Okay, and so the important condition that we need is called punching condition. And V satisfies this punching condition. If I can find a sub representation F plus of V, we saw it's a stable GQP module. In general, MP will not be reducible, but when I restrict to GQP, I can have something reducible. And they want it to contain all the non negative watch state weight. So I must have zero, one, two, and so on. Example, classical example is the ordinary elliptic curve. An elliptic curve over ZP has good ordinary reduction if the P torsion is an extension of the mu P of some of the root of P root of unit by the et al group. I forgot to put a zero there. And uh, the Tate module is important, is somehow is the inverse limit of the P torsion. I should have put here the inverse limit of P to the N. And is an extension by ZP twisted by one because the inverse limit of the P root of unit are somehow ZP twisted by one, the same twist that appears here. And uh, ZP is the trivial representation. I still forgot to get the zero at the end. And this is ordinary because you see, as, as a Galois module, this is reducible. I have a sub representation and a sub quotient. Moreover, when I consider the function of the elliptic curve at one, this is bringing the edge state weight here look like one and zero, but when I consider the L function at one, the edge state weight will be zero and minus one. And so here I have the non-negative, uh, the non-negative uh, edge state weight. And the same for an ordinary modular form. I can decompose the Galois representation like this. I have a sub-object where uh, I axel the inertia acts as the K minus one cyclotomic character, which is exactly this twist type of twist there, times an unramified character, and I have an unramified quotient. So the state weight of K minus one and zero. And when I consider any integer between one and K minus one, K minus one minus j will be non-negative and this number will be negative. Sorry, you want it? And, yeah? I think uh, Ariel want to ask a question? Yeah, may, may I ask yeah. you another question? So if you start with an elliptic curve and you want to look, uh, because you only consider critical points, right? Yes, yes. Ah, uh, okay, okay. No, because I was a little confused with this zero and one. In some case, the condition seems like empty, but this is oh. not the critical point, right? You cannot no, take no, no, zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is important. I should have said the punches condition is for a motive which is critical at zero. Okay, okay, thank you. <clears throat> and so, yeah, the function of the elliptic curve is not critical at zero, so we have to test by one, and so we get that our state weight will be something like k minus, well, zero and minus one, or for a modular form, k minus two and minus one. Yeah, so that, that's why the ordinary condition really plays a role, because it's zero yeah, and yeah, minus exactly. one. And, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, no, otherwise, no, yeah, yeah, this is important. I must be critical at zero, and so it must be like this. You can probably do something with critical at one, and then you just get the positive, or the non, probably the non negative, the negative only, and then maybe you would see it. But so, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, well, and why do we have, do we need this punches condition? It's some sort of, mm -hmm. It plays the role of the F plus. This F plus plays the role of the plus part in the comparison isomorphism. Somehow one can check that if I'm not the linear critical, then my number are, are off. And so this is not an isomorphism, which makes way more hard to find the number to put here. So if I'm critical, this is an isomorphism and I'm at a good place. And somehow I need something periodically. And this F plus is literally some sort that plus part of the Deran homology, if you want. If you believe that these Och state weights are transported into the uh, Och state, Och number of my motive. Okay, so now I can finally tell you the conjecture, which in this form is due to Kotler and Perron-Rieu. We take a motive M, which is critical at zero, and suppose that the periodic 
representation satisfy Punch's condition. Then we have a functions that uh, when evaluated, at, 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 which is a formal series, that when I plug in t equal chi of one plus p, one plus p to the j minus one, for j critical, I get a certain factor at p, a certain factor at infinity, and the L function of m evaluated at j from which I remove all the other factor at p, divided by the period. So just a few words, e infinity is gonna look like some sort of gamma functions, and it's gonna have some power of two pi i. And EP is, to be precise, is the gamma factor of V modulo F plus of V. And it's gonna look like some sort of abelian or non-abelian god sum. It depends a bit on how you are, if you're supercuspidal or not. Times some one minus alpha P to the minus J. This look exactly like the Euler factor of this L function, or at least a part of it. Times one minus alpha to the minus one, P to the J minus one. And these are the same alpha. And let's see if this is true, for example, for a modular form. I take my ordinary modular form, alpha and beta are the true roots of the echo polynomial. If chi is ramified, meaning that if chi is not trivial, you remember from the interpolation formula that we got uh, this number, which is kind of the Gauss sum, this number times the Gauss sum, which is kind of the Gauss sum of the which of the, well, of the plus part. What happened instead of the V modulo F plus part? What happened instead if I, oh, sorry, I would better if we stay here. So what, what do we get when chi is trivial? When chi is trivial, we get this two factor that multiply the, the L function with all the factors. So let's remember this two factor and let's see what happened. In our case, when chi is trivial, I have this factor, one minus beta p to the minus j. This cancel out half of the factor that uh, are in the L functions. So I'm left just with this factor. And the other factor is this one. And you see that if I take this over this, I get exactly this ratio with the multiplied L function with no L factor at p. So it seems like the recipe works, at least in our case. And uh, today I want to talk about the radical function in a particular case, which is the case of Siegel modular form. So I consider the Siegel upper half space, <coughs> which is uh, the set of um, complex G times, C G times G matrices, which are symmetric, and such that the, uh, the, um, the positive part of Y, the, such that the imaginary part is positive definite. So if I take G equal to one, I just have one times one met complex numbers with positive uh, real part, uh, imaginary part. So I get back the Poincaré upper half plane. Now I have an action of GSP to G of Z, which acts as linear transformation. And the linear and my single modular form of weight 2R is nothing less than a function from this space into C, which is holomorphic. And it satisfies a similar transformation formula as the one we have used to see for modular form for all gamma that live in a particular congruent subgroup of yes, P to G of Z. So it's kind of, this is the natural generalization of a modular form. It's an holomorphic function, which satisfies a nice transformation with respect to a Mabius action. HG of the complex number are the matrices, so in the definition of Sorry? the- Sorry? Uh, yeah, they are symmetric, uh, symmetric matrices. Okay. <coughs> Okay, and uh, for a single form, what do I define? I take, uh, for every prime L, I define the form, Sataki parameter of F at L. I add G different complex number. Well, at least if F is uh, of uh, hyperspatial level, I have G, non-zero complex number, alpha one, alpha G, that depend on L. They are well defined up to permutation. I can move them around, or I can invert one, invert the other. And uh, these are some of the static parameters for sp to g. When I work with gsp to g, I also have another one, which is a sort of up eigenvalues, alpha zero. And I have the following relation. If I multiply the static parameter with the square of this uh, alpha zero parameter, I get uh, p to a certain number is the weight 2r times g minus g, g plus one minus two. 
And uh, for GL2, this looks a bit different. The Sataka parameter will be some, oops, there is a typo here, will be something like beta L over alpha L. And uh, you see that alpha zero L square is kind of alpha L square. So that, as I was telling you, this should be the Sataka parameter for uh, SL2 of Z. And the UP operator, we don't really have UP operator for SL2. We have the UP square operator for SL2, and that's why this relation. It, this is just a matter of normalization, how people prefer to work. And we use this to define two different type of L functions. The first one is called standard. It is the of degree 2G plus one, meaning that is a product of polynomial in S to the minus S of degree 2G plus one. Somehow here I'm taking the product over only some good L prime. And this one minus L to the minus S times the product of all my Sataka parameter. Then I take one and it's inverse and then I multiply all of them. So this is really independent of what do I choose for the alpha is. And the spin L function of degree two to the G is defined instead I take all the possible, I, I fix some Sataka parameter such a way that somehow these are integral. These are P integral. Oh, sorry, this should have been NL, by the way. So I take my spinel function and I take all the possible product of my Satake parameters. There are two G possible choice of a subset of Satake parameter. I multiply them and this gives me one factor. And then I multiply over the two to the G possible choices and I get exactly my spinel functions. If you are wondering where are the name coming from? Oh, well, first of all, what happened for a modular form, classical modular form? The standard is called the sim square and the spin is what is somehow the normal one. And this come, this na they na the names come from something from Langlands correspondence. Somehow if we have a single modular form is an automorphic form on uh, GSP2G. So we expect the Galois representation to take values in the Langlands dual, which is uh, the spin representation of the, of the dimension 2G plus one. And the spin representation is a double cover of uh, an orthogonal group. So it has a kind of standard representation as 2G plus one matrices. But when I have the spin representation, I have some construction called the Clifford construction that give us a 2 dimensional vector space. So I have the spin representation. This is the standard representation of G-spin. This is the spin representation of G-spin. And you can see that you get back the right L function of the, at least of the L function of the right degree. Now we have this L representation thanks to work of Kret and Sheen. And so we really have this true representation. Okay, and what do we know? So a standard oh. is, oh, I'm sorry. A standard is yeah. gel 2G plus one. Plus one, yeah, because uh, these are, this is kind of an orthogonal group in 2G plus one variable. And you can see an orthogonal group in N variable as a subset of GLN. So that's why it's called standard because this orthogonal subgroup are, stand, are normally inside the GLN, where N is the dimension of vector space. And the other one is the spin because G spin is this funny spin representation. Yeah, so some people call the spin for GL2 the standard because it's a standard representation yeah. <laughs> of GL2 is GL2. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was. It's confusing. I agree. I was confused at the beginning. I was confused at the beginning, but then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the difference between GL2 or G GL2 is GSP2, but it's also GSPIN3. So it clearly depends on how you are seeing it. Yeah, yeah. If I see GSPIN3 as GL2, then the spin is the standard. Confused. Okay, and for modular form, we already seen that we have a periodic L function. And we also have the one for the symmetric square, thanks to work to Schmidt and Dida. Thanks to the pullback formula, we have in uh, practically for all kind of uh, ordinary modular form, or ordinary single form, we have the standard L function, even if the weight is non scalar. Somehow I was just giving you, ah, uh, yeah, there was a mistake in my definition of the Sigma modular form, also I forgot the determinant, but you can take any kind of representation of JLG and you get scalar weight forms, you get even families of forms. 
And this has been constructed first by Becker and Schmidt and then by Sheng Liu using the pullback formula. The spin is a bit uh, trickier. Somehow it's uh, the easy one for modular form, but it's less easy when we go on. For example, for just before is the recent work of Leffler, Piloni, Skinner, and Zerbes. And what we're going to do today is we go a step further, we go to genus tree. Somehow, the, one of the main, we will see later, but uh, somehow the spin and function are very mysterious because we don't have nice <coughs> uh, analytic representation of this L function. And let me tell you what happened. So what happened in the genus tree? The spinning representation is eight dimension. I put here all the possible Frobenius eigenvalues and the corresponding odd state weight. And uh, well, this is just for uh, to bookkeeping to see what are the odd state weight. I'm a weight two R. And the smallest of state weight is zero. The largest one is six r minus six. And so what is the theorem we prove? We take a family of parallel weight, even ordinary Siegel form. The definition of ordinary that we have is that this UP eigenvalues is one. And uh, so what we do, we construct with, uh, oh, I should have said, this is all joint work with Ellen Nation and Shkaniksha. And so what do we do? We construct a two variable periodical function. LP of FT, one variable is the psychotomic variable T, one is the weight variable of F, such that when I put weight to R and I evaluate at J, for J in this range, 3R minus 2 and 4R minus 5, I get exactly what Koch was expecting, the L function without all R factor at P, divided by a period, which is the Peterson norm of F, times an all R factor at infinity, this is kind of four gamma functions, times the factor at P that uh, we, the, I should also say that this is a work almost still a bit in progress. And uh, the Euler factor at P, at least at the moment, seems to be the right one, and is exactly this one. Indeed, let's go back to the previous slide. The edge state weight, you see the integer J that we care about go from 4, 5, 4 R minus 5, 3 R minus 2. So somehow, these are always the non-negative odd state weight, and these are the uh, negative odd state weight, and these are exactly the four terms that appear here. And so somehow this seems to be compatible with code conjecture. A question? Two questions? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So first, that is caspidal and spherical at P. Sorry? Your forms are caspidal and also spherical. Ah, yes, yes, P. definitely. Caspidal is spherical at P2, or you are allowing some room? Uh, uh, I, I think, uh, well, I think we can allow ramification as long as it's of uh, Ivory level. Ivory level. Yeah, somehow what, <clears throat> I mean, the family doesn't interpolate, the family interpolate only if it's stabilized form, if you want. So our form must be of Ivory level. Does it answer your question? Uh, I mean, yeah, your, the automorphic representation behind, I mean, is, is it spherical at P or not? Uh, yes, but this is because if you are ordinary, you have uh, a finite number of points where you can be non spherical. Oh, okay, that but is true for in this situation, in, in this generality. I mean, for more general uh, cases, you can prove these kind of things. I mean, well, yes, because you have a classification of all the possible Iwari fixed vector. You have a classification somehow of all the possible, they uh, call it. Uh, automorphic representation, you have any worry fixed vector, and you see that there are some constraints between the AK values. Okay. Like if you are Steinberger, alpha 1 must be P alpha 2, and so on. Like and in JQ or Q. Is P yeah, exactly. Or AK. Exactly. As long as this vary in a periodic family, if the ratio, the ratio alpha 1 over alpha 2 must be equal to P. This is a closed subspace of the weight space. Okay. And that this kind of things works for all just P to G or just Yes, I would say yes. Oh. In general, you just know that this is true outside a closed subspace. So it could be of codimension. Okay. Depends on the way of variable, but it could be the codimension G minus one. Okay. Okay. One more question, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, please, please. So for just before you have just before equal just P five to just pin five. Yes. So you have two exactly. possible generalities. Just pin six, or you can think about just no, just ah, 
just pin seven or just p six why you are doing just p six and not just pin six seven uh no sorry repeat uh, so for just before i'm going back uh, a spin is equal to uh, two just p it's equal to seven just pin seven yes no no i mean just pin no. yes a five is equal or related to just before yes just before so yes. when you want to go beyond that you have two possible generalities go to just ah. pin modular forms or just ah. or seagull modular forms why you yeah. are working on the seagull side and not in the just pin side well because i don't know much about uh, g spin family uh -huh. First of all, the only time you have Shimura variety, you need the, the G spin 7 must have signature like 5 2. So it's kind of a dimmer form of our G spin or something like that. We should, I mean, it's, clearly it would be interesting to do that, but it's harder. Okay. Okay, thanks. No, I mean, there is, for example, there is a pullback formula for G spin. So technically, one can expect to have a periodical function for G spin too. I mean, for one single form, you can do something, something like that. I suppose, yes, honest, yes, I think so. It's probably difficult because uh, we can discuss a bit later if yeah, we yeah. are interested. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No problem. <clears throat> so yeah, so I somehow also, okay. So we have, this is our theorem, how do we prove it? The first step is to show that the Lynch conjecture all for this L function. And this is really a difficult step. Like we don't know algebraicity for the spinel function for GSP8, GSP10, and so on. And uh, the idea is to find an integral expression of this L function. So writing this L function as the integral of my form f against something that we can understand well. Once we have this expression, what we do? We show that all the objects that appear vary periodically with j and with the weight, and this will give us our periodical functions. So the starting point is the result of X Docimov that says that the spinel function as an expression as an infinite sum. And then Pollack, Aaron Pollack, has very recently shown that this infinite sum is equal to the integral of my Seeger modular form F over the upper half plane over H3. Uh, it's equal to the integral of F against a certain Eisen series that I call each work I S plus 5 minus 3 R. There are some weird normalization involved. And uh, this e to r chi is an Eisen series for a group G that I pull back from H3. So the question is, what is this G? It's a very funny group. I start with a quaternion algebra B, and I define a vector, a vector space of dimension uh, 32, I guess, which has a copy of Q, so a line. Then Hermitian three by three matrices with coefficient in B. This is dimension 15. I have a three rational number on the diagonal, and then I have three quaternions on the upper part that determines the lower part. And then I, I kind of make it symplectic. So I add the, the same stuff twice. Okay, so I have this nice 32 dimensional vector space, and Aaron Pollack defines, well, it was known even before, there is a symplectic form here, and there is a quartic form. So somehow I take a vector here and I give it a number, which is of degree four in the entries. And what is my group G? Is the subset of the automorphisms of this W cross GM, such that when I act from uh, my automorphism of W on my vector, uh, I almost preserve the symplectic form up to a similitude, that is this one. And I also preserve the quartic form up to the square of the other similitude. So you see, it's a weird stuff that looks a bit, a bit it's a weird mixture of an of a orthogonal group and a symplectic form. And yeah, I, I see the face that Daniel is making. And I, I, it was my same reaction I had to this group. <clears throat> is extremely unnatural to me. And so let's try to say a bit more about it. We have a natural embedding of GSP6 of G, which I'm not going to write down because it involves taking the, a 
vector, the exterior algebra of this da of uh, the natural space of this W and embedding stuff is very complicated. But uh, what we know about G is that it's almost a unitary group in uh, of sigma two three three over the quaternion. So this is good. What does it mean that is practical? It means that I have my U three three over B. This is this is a nice Shimura, var billion, um, Shimura variety of POL type, I think, or at least of uh, type. Then I take a central extension and then I quotient by a different center and I get my G. So what is the useful stuff for this description? The symmetric space for G is then the same one as the symmetric space of U33. And so it's just the set of Hermitian matrices, symmetric matrix in uh, <coughs> coefficient with B tensor over Q with C. So somehow I have uh, symmetric matrices in entries in this quaternion, split quaternion algebra. And uh, why should this make us make feel better? Because what happened? The center. Hmm? Question? Or, uh, no, maybe there is a problem with no? the microphone of someone. Ah, okay. So why uh, maybe why is this? No, I don't okay. see any raised end. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> so why is this good? Well, because the center of this quaternion algebra is C. This is two by two matrices over C, and they have the diagonal matrices. And the embedding of C as the center of this one gives us the embedding of the Siegel upper space inside here. So somehow this is making, at least for me, more clear the relationship between G and GSP6. <clears throat> GSP6 lives inside, well, I can, the symmetric domain for GSP6 lives inside the symmetric domain for G. And so now we have to define what is the, now that we more or less know what is the local symmetric space, I have to give you the Eisen series. And the Eisen series, I define it somewhat classically. First of all, for J, I define an automorphic factor that extends the automorphic factor for J, for GSP6. Then I define a parabolic subgroup P of G, which is the stabilizer of the line 0, 0, 0, 1. So I put here is 0, here the 0 matrix, 0 matrix, here I put 1, and I consider the stabilizer of this. It's a sort of lower triangular matrices. And my Einstein series is up to some number that I don't want to say. These are power of pi and L function to remove some poles. It's just the sum of a certain congruent subgroup, modulo the stabilizer of infinity, <clears throat> of the automorphic factor times the character chi. And uh, this is literally, these are kind of matrices that are congruent to modulo n are matrices in the parabolic P. As for GL2, the usual congruent subgroup are uh, matrices that are congruent to the Borel modulo n, because they are the triangular modulo n. This is gamma not of n. I can do the same. I take the integer matrices in G, that when I reduce modulo p, modulo n, I get an element in uh, p of z modulo n, and then I sum over all of this. I take out the stabilizer of infinity to avoid having uh, some that don't converge. And this is my nice size and series. And the Ethereum theorem, it has been proven by Karel, Tsao, and Kim in more general settings, but only at level one. We had an event typus and the level is that we can calculate the Fourier expansion of this Einstein series. And when we put S equal to R, we get something which is nice and holomorphic. Somehow the ER, H, if you know the Fourier expansion for uh, GSP6, is indexed by symmetric three by three matrix. Here, what I have, I have the Hermitian three by three matrix over the quaternion algebra, and then I take the dual. This is kind of always three by three matrices because I have a trace. And I have some sort of norm of H, R minus five. And then I have uh, some small polynomial. You should think of this as uh, P to the K minus one for a classical Eisen series. When you have an Eisen series, you know that uh, <coughs> AP of an Eisen series is sigma of k of p, and sigma of k is p to the k minus plus one. So this is very similar to the classical situation. And this is good because once we have an holomorphic Eisen series, this is holomorphic. We also have a differential operator. 
that uh, well, I, gave, I write to you here uh, the expression. And the good thing about the differential operator is that erase the weight without changing the S between I's and series. And uh, the operator theta is defined such that when I take Q to the H, I get the norm of H times Q to the H. And the Q to the H is as usually something like E to the two pi I, the trace of Z times H. So it's the classical generalization of the Q for modular form. So yeah, this is gonna be some sort of kind of one over two pi I D over DZ or something like that, this differential operator. Okay, and uh, it's easy to see from this expression that if this is algebraic, this is also algebraic, it's not, it's nearly holomorphic, meaning that some terms appear of the form one over not y, where y are the entries of the imaginary part. It's, ex it's a generalization, if you want, of the classical nearly holomorphic form for GL2. And I have a nice Fourier expression, which is algebraic. So now what do I do? I go for my orthonormal basis for my space of Seeger modular form, my level. The first one is my form F that I fixed and I complete it. I always can always do it. It's a Grand Schmidt normalization. And then I have an algebraic map that sends G into the Peterson norm of G against F slash by the actin liner divided by the Peterson norm of F slash by the actin liner and F. And this is kind of the projection of F over the F component. And in particular, if G is algebraic, this basis is algebraic, everything is algebraic. So this is an algebraic number. So I just told you before that these are uh, algebraic nearly holomorphic form, at least when you pull them back to GSP6, they are classical nearly holomorphic form for GSP6. I take the Peterson product against F, I divide by this, and then I get a nice rational number. And uh, this so by Pollock, this integral is practically the L function divide pi to the four times S zero minus six R plus six. And so this proves the linear conjecture for these values for S zero in the range that I gave you before, kind of between three R and four R. And these are not all the critical values. This is just half of it. But the function equation relates the other critical values from two R until three R to this one. So we kind of get information about all critical values. Somehow we, we just consider half of the critical values because the other one are the same, thanks to a function equation. That is not complete, but okay. So using the Fourier expansion of um, our Einstein series and the operator theta that I told you is kind of bring down the norm of H, I can define a p-adic uh, family of Einstein series, which is just this. It should be a sum over all H whose norm is, I forgot to put P does not divide norm of H. So you see, here rho and sigma are two periodic variables that play the role of the weight R in the cyclotomic variable S. And then I just have the sum of this norm of H to this thing. This is a nice periodic function. This polynomial are evaluated in L to the minus two R minus two sigma. So this is again a nice periodic function. And these are periodic forms associated with a family of nearly of a convergent form. So now my periodic function is easy. I take my eta family, I take the eigenpotent for the egg operator. And uh, if the eigenspace associated to my family is one dimension, my periodic function is very easy to define. It's nothing else. I take my um, Eisen's periodic Eisen series and then I apply this ordinary projector. <clears throat> and uh, this is going to be kind of a linear multiple of my family F, and so I'm done. And this gives me my theoretical function. And just last slide, what happens if the eigenspace for F is larger? When I apply this, I will get a bunch of, uh, I will get a bunch of different families of uh, Siegel form, all of them with the same echo operator. So I just pick a random linear form. For example, I take the H for a coefficient of my, of this series, LF of E rho sigma. And this is gonna be then element in my periodic function because it's gonna be an element in the somehow the, well, and then this is gonna be, the HL function is kinda gonna be a two variable function. And this is exactly what is gonna be our periodic function. If you look confused, think, suppose your Eisen series, when you project it is A1 F1 plus A2 F2. If I take uh, any random Fourier coefficient, 
is going to be just the a1 times the Fourier coefficient of the f1 plus a2 times the Fourier coefficient of a2. And then you calculate a2 and a1 using the Peterson norm, and you get that, uh, exactly your periodic health function. In this case, the interpolation formula will not be as neat as there will be a few sum of uh, Peterson norm, but it's not particularly important. Okay, uh, muchas gracias. It's the end. <laughs> Thanks for, uh, for your talk. Uh, hello, someone? Yes. Oh, okay, thanks for the talk. Thank was you very much. Very, very nice. Uh, oh, I'm glad you like, glad you like. Uh, do you have any question, maybe, someone? Someone have a question, maybe? Uh, doesn't look like. No? Oh, no, I have, I have some questions, maybe. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so in, in the last part, is it's expected to have multiplicity one for every this kind of forms or no? No, in general, if suppose if your form is some sort of Saito Kurokawa, um, this is for GSP4. But if you have some sort of endoscopic, um, if at a certain prime L you are endoscopic, you will not expect to have multiplicity one. Ah, okay, but the, okay, okay. But if you are endoscopic, that means the L function appears in some small group, something like that. No, no, no if you are locally endoscopic. Oh. I think it's already a problem of local representation, not global. Oh, you can be locally endoscopic, but not globally. Yeah, like, uh, I think so. I think uh, at L, I can look like a Saito-Kurokawa lift, but not in other places. Okay, so uh, that gives you... I guess. Don't take it for granted, but I think it okay, should be. Okay, okay. So this, I, I was asking, this condition to have multiplicity one is a, a, a real condition, I mean, it's not. Um, um, yes, but otherwise uh, it's just for, for simplicity. If you don't have multiplicity one, you, your periodic interpolation will just be uh, practically equal to what uh, we have. It's gonna be this times this factor plus a small sum of Fourier coefficient of S sum over all the form in my eigenspace, Fourier coefficient of F divided by this Peterson norm, something like that. Okay. Somehow, one way to solve this, you should show that somehow you can, for, uh, you can, uh, my, if I have more than dimension one, I have like two form. Mm -hmm. Can I, do I know that this form are always at, at all classical weight, the specialization of these two forms are orthogonal. If this were true, then the problem is solved. If these two forms are... Ah, so are I so, two suppose two that my eigenspace is two-dimensional. Yeah, okay. So I have two family, F1 and F2. Can I choose the family F1 and F2 such that any time I specialize at classical weight, the specialization of F1 is orthogonal for the Peterson norm, the specialization of F2. Two. And how helps that? Oh, because then I just because if I then I just take the component of my SN series on the first one and I know that. Oh. Somehow using I know well I know well how to calculate the Peterson norm of F against me. It's a problem of decomposing something in an orthogonal basis mm -hmm. because ideally you would like to take exactly the Peterson product. Uh, ideally I would like to interpolate this precisely but uh, if I have a family here and uh, I mean a priori when I play the projector here this is going to be a component to f1 and f2. So if F1 is not orthogonal to F2, when I take this product, I will get some extra term. And so that's why. Okay. Uh, Xing Liu did this for the uh, standard L function for Gs in general, and she explained well how to take care of this. Yeah, but I was thinking that if you form, you, you can pass to GL to G, no? 
G, uh, yeah, two power G, and there, then there you have multiplicity one, no? So the uh, yes. function is some way well determined. determined. So you, so you are uh, just yes. one well defined periodical function if there is a, a periodical function in the setting of GL, GLN, I mean. Okay. So you are in this setting um, producing different periodical functions? No, I think you are right. What you could do, you can take the 2G representation and uh, you use some sort of uh, modularity theorem. Oh, no. Somehow we don't know. We only know the best, the 2G representation comes from a or unitary group, I assume, of rank 2G, oh. but this is only potential modularity. If you have, uh, and then the standard L function for the unitary group is exactly the speed one. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that you have potential modularity, so you will get the L function of restricted to a smaller group. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and if you are wondering why don't I work with G-spin is that in literature we don't, it's very difficult to do algebraic stuff with G-spin because uh, the only, sh we, well, first of all, the type Schumer variety of type G-spin are not studied that much. And even when they are studied, we don't have nice uh, integral expression for them and so on. Also the pullback yeah. formula is, yeah, yeah, what did I say? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah, already just even the, the pullback formula is difficult because uh, I don't think you have algebraicity for the pullback formula. Oh, so you have no because, the linear theorem, some, the linear... Uh, yeah, exactly. The problem is that uh, if I want to use the pullback formula, I have something which is algebraic, so I have like G spin of 2G minus 1, 2. Then I have to take the dual one, and on top I need to have something like... Uh, G spin for G plus two, which is not, doesn't have a Shimura variety. Oh, yeah. So the difficult part is to choose a section above such that when you pull back, you get something nice and holomorphic or. Yeah. For G spin, you have discrete series, something like that. You have no Shimura variety in general, something like that. Uh, I think you have just discrete series only if you have signature N2. No, I mean, it's very interesting, but it's tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. So maybe you have some more questions? <laughs> I don't see any end race or anything like no, that. No, I think Ariel needed to leave because he was in some meeting. So or maybe oh, thanks. I will, we will thanks again the speaker. Muchas gracias. Talk. Um, okay. Oh, thanks for like the talk. It. It, was, it, was, it was very nice. I like it. Very uh, good. Uh, yeah, a lot of ideas. And it's, it's Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. <laughs> I think we can stop recording now. Oh, yeah. So, Thank you very much for recording. Oh, okay.